Hey guys, thanks for uh, making it out to the meetup today. Uh, hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you had a little bit of fun. Uh, so we're just going to jump right into the material. Uh, this is my second take of the video because the first time apparently I forgot to display the correct screen. Uh, so I was talking and you had no idea what I was talking about, which should feel, uh, I guess, somewhat normal at this point. All right. So we're picking up where we left off uh, during our last meetup. During the last meetup, uh, we did a lab called Secrets and Ciphers. Uh, and so uh, we applied the ROT13 cipher uh, to encrypt some texts. So today we'll be picking off, uh, picking up uh, where we left off there. So just as a quick recap, uh, we talked about, you know, what is a cipher? We need a way of taking what we consider plain text, which is our message, doing something to it so that we get this garbled output at the end, right? And we call that our cipher text. Uh, but we also need a way of reversing that to take our cipher text and, and turn it back into something meaningful, right? Okay, so we talked about block ciphers, stream ciphers. Uh, we'll just jump right over that. Substitution ciphers, right? So we used the ROT13 where we essentially said, okay, uh, I'm going to, anytime I see this character, I'm going to substitute this other character, right? And I'm not going to worry about, uh, you know, moving them around, which is what we see in transposition. Okay, I'm just going to do a one-for-one -one kind of uh, match. And so, ROT13 was really easy to do that because the English alphabet has 26 characters in it. So, if we uh, divide that in half, we get 13. And so, every time I rotate 13, I end up, you know... Uh, if I do that twice, I end up back at the same character I started at. So if I start with an A, like you see on the chart here, and I'm checking over to make sure again I'm displaying the correct stuff. But if I start at an A, uh, I move 13 characters, I'll end up at the N. But then if I move 13 characters again, I'll end up back at the beginning of the alphabet with an A. Okay, And so we applied that uh, to a little bit of... Uh, Python programming. Uh, today, however, we're going to move on from that. And there's this concept of symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. Uh, and those are just big words meaning symmetric, I'm going to use the same key for both encryption and decryption. Uh, asymmetric encryption, meaning I'm going to use a different key for encryption and decryption. Now, the example we'll, we see most often in asymmetric encryption is the use of digital certificates. Well, what is a digital certificate? Well, if I, uh, doesn't look like I have a browser open, so let's go and open up Firefox, All right? So if I open up my browser, uh, I can go to www.google.com. And this automatically forwards me to the HTTPS version, right? So uh, hopefully you can see that on your screen. Uh, but this is the HTTPS, right? Uh, the encrypted portion of it. And we see this little lock appear to the left-hand side. And it, when I hover over it, it says verified by Google Trust Services. Well, that's pretty cool. So let's click on that. And it says connection is secure. So if I click on that. Uh, this has a bad habit of loading behind, except this time it didn't do that. So let me try this again. More information. All right, there it went. Okay, so we have this, uh, you know, little printout. And there's some details in here. And we can actually go in and view the certificate. And so the certificate has various components and information in here. But essentially, what this is, is a public certificate. And this helps uh, identify uh, identify uh, the Google sort or the Google website, right? So Google generated a public private key pair. And so they can take their private key, which they don't share with anyone else, and they can sign certain things with it. And so then they can make their public key available through the use of this digital certificate. And because of the way that these things work, we can go through and validate, okay, if I can decrypt this message, 
with their public key, I know that they're the only ones that should have been able to encrypt it in the beginning. And so it's a way for me then to say, okay, well, this was signed by Google, right? And so it's this private key, public key relationship that enables me to identify the website I go to and make sure I'm arriving at the correct place, right? And so they keep their private key private and they make their public key public, right? So two different keys, right? And so that's at the heart of what these digital certificates do uh, is, you know, help identify um, websites and, and, and who signed what. They, they have lots of functions, but under the hood, they're using asymmetric encryption. These algorithms that expect there to be a, two different keys, right? A public and a private key, right? Well, today, we're not going to do asymmetric encryption. We're going to apply symmetric encryption where I'm going to apply a key to a message uh, or in our case, a file, uh, and I'll use it for both encryption and decryption. So same key for encryption and decryption, right? And so in order to do that, we're going to use this thing called XOR, right? Exclusive OR, right? Now, if you've never seen uh, a chart like what you see on your screen, it can be a little bit confusing, right? These are standard uh, electronics co uh, type components, AND gates, OR gates, XOR gates, right? And we could look at, you know, what these zeros and ones do, and it can kind of get confusing. So I'm going to try an example on you. Hopefully uh, it helps you out. But I'll bring up a terminal uh, so that, you know, I can kind of get a background here and let me get my drawing pad out. Okay, so what happens if there's four of us, right? So we're all friends. Well, we think we're all friends, right? Except that two of our friends, let's say, uh, we'll say over here, I have Sally. And over here, I have Tim or Timmy. Uh, and either way, they're our friends. Uh, but for whatever reason, they're not really friends with each other. And so we decide, hey, we're going to, you know, sing songs and hold hands, right? So uh, we're going to do that. But for Sally and Tim, they've decided, okay, we'll play along with this, um, but we're not holding hands with each other. So it's like, okay, cool. Uh, if you were to stand up here, and I'll put myself down here. So I'll say this is me. So you, me, Timmy, and Sally, right? And so the goal is for us all to hold hands, but Tim and Sally, or Timmy and Sally, they don't they don't want to hold hands. So Tim extends his arm out. All right, so he's going to hold hands. He's got these really long arms. I've got a really long arm too. So we hold hands. And then you extend your arm, you hold a hand with Timmy, you hold Sally's hand, and I hold Sally's other hand, right? So now we have this big circle, we're all holding hands. Well, what does this look like if we were to say, well, this is actually a, an electronic circuit, right? So we'll say this is you, and we'll say this is me, and we'll check to see if Timmy and Sally, so Sally and Timmy, if they're connected in some way, right? So we'll say if somebody's not holding hands, that's a zero. If somebody is holding hands, that's a one. So if we start out and we'll say neither one of us are holding hands, right? So if we dropped these hands, if neither one of us hold hands, there's no pathway from Timmy whether that's through you or through me to Sally. So, oops, so they are not connected, right? So this is a zero. Well, what happens if you decide, okay, I'm gonna help out and I'll start holding hands, but I'm not holding hands yet, right? Well, in this case, Timmy and Sally are connected, right? They're connected through you, right? And so we say this is a connection. Well, if you drop your hands, but I put up mine, 
Well, they're connected, right? Now they're connected through me. What happens if both of us are holding hands? Well, then they're still definitely connected. Now they just have two pathways through. But either way, they are connected. All right. So this is an OR gate. I almost said AND. This is an OR gate. If either OR, so if either of us are holding hands, they're definitely connected. If both of us are holding hands, well, they're still connected. So, right? So, as long as one of these ends up being a one, we end up with a one as our output, right? And so that is a, an OR gate, right? And so, if we look back at our chart, so if I erase this, turn that off, come back up, what we see is that is, in fact, our OR, right? So, we see that as long as somebody's holding a hand, we get a one as an output. But if both of us are not holding hands, well, we definitely don't have a connection, right? So Timmy and Sally are definitely not connected if both of us drop our hands, okay? So what about the AND gate, right? So we still have Sally over here. Let me bring up my drawing pad again. We still have Sally. We still have Tim. Timmy. All right. That was terrible. <clears throat> anyway, so they've decided, okay, they'll go along with our plan to hold hands and sing songs. But two hands is a little weird. So Sally gives us one of her hands. Timmy gives us one of his hands. So we're going to stand here in the middle. We're going to stand here in the middle. Extend hands. Extend hands, right? So this is you. And maybe this is me, right? So we're still connecting Sally and Timmy. But this time, those two are only using one arm, okay? We're still using both of ours, but they're only using one of theirs. So what does that chart look like? So we'll say this is you, this is me, and are we connected? So if neither of us are holding hands, well, then they're definitely not connected. If one of us holds hands, well, there's no connection, right? So if you're holding hands here, but I'm not holding a hand, then they're definitely not connected. If you're not holding hands, but I'm holding hands, well, we're still not connected. But if we both hold hands, Timmy and Sally are finally connected, right? And so now in this relationship, we see is both of us, both of us have to be holding hands in order for Tim and Sally to be connected. And we call this our AND gate. So it only works if both inputs are a one. Okay. So let me erase that, turn off my drawing pad, and we'll check that on the chart. So let's see. That is, in fact, what we get. So if both of us are holding hands, they're connected. But if either one of us drop a, a hand, they're definitely not connected. So they're only connected when both of us are holding hands. Okay? So now we're down to our XOR. And XOR is the one that we really care about for this exercise. So, oops, let me bring this up. I got to turn my pad off. There we go. So we still have Sally. And we still have Tim. And Tim has decided, okay, I will extend both arms. I'm a loving kind of fellow. We've got you. And we've got me. And we decide, okay, yep, we will hold the hands of Tim. And then we go to hold hands with Sally. And Sally says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, this is this is all getting a little weird with all this hand-holding thing. 
you know, I was with you for a while, but this is starting to get weird. I'm still only going to do the one arm thing, right? I'm going to extend a single arm. The issue is, is that, yeah, I'm going to extend an arm, but I'm only going to hold one hand at a time. I don't do this two hands, two people holding my one hand thing. Again, this is weird enough. So that means that only one of us can hold Sally's hand at a time. So what does that chart look like? So you, me, and are we connected? So if neither one of us are holding hands, right, then we are not connected. But what happens if you are able to hold a hand, but I am not, right? So now you're holding Sally's hand, right? Well, there's a connection now from Timmy through you to Sally. So they are connected. You drop your hand, and Sally's like, okay, I will hold your hand. So my hand, right? So they're connected now through me. Now, what happens if both of us offer up our hand? Well, in this case, since we're both offering up our hand, and Sally's already kind of weirded out about it, she pulls her hand back. And that means Sally is not connected to Tim. So we find this chart of the only time they're connected is when only one of us is holding a hand. And in the binary world of ones and zeros, this actually turns out to be, I only get a one when only one of us is set. When only one of the bits is set, I get a one. Or better said, I only get a one when our bits are different. So notice here that these are the same, I get a zero. These are the same, I get a zero. These are different, I get a one. These are different, I get a one, right? So either way you wanna think about it, that's how it works, right? Either only one of us can be set at a time to get a one, or we have to be different in order to get a one right so let's check the chart again so erase turn that off and come back all right and so we see the same relationship down here if i go back to my mouse we see the same relationship here if we're different we get a one if we're the same i get a zero okay and it's that relationship that we're going to use in our lab so if I take a number, right? So we found out last week that every character has a number that's associated with it. So if I go back to my terminal, I can type in ASCII. It's a program I have installed and I can blow this up a little bit to make it a little bit easier for you to see. And we'll see that, okay, a 97, let's find 97. So this is character A, right? So this is decimal 97. I have the character A, right? And so again, under the hood, all of these have a value associated with them. So what if I consider A is, is the uh, character I'm trying to encrypt, right? And the first character of my key, let's say is a D. And so I have a 100 that I have. So if I XOR both of those together, what I see is whenever there's a difference, I get a one. Whenever they're the same, I get a zero. Different, I get a one. The same, I get a zero. And so I just go all the way down the line and I res the result is a totally different number. So I started at 97, I XORed it with 100 and I ended up with a five. But again, we're looking for any time they're the same, you know, we put a zero whenever they're different we put a one and this has the the ability then to somewhat toggle some of these ones into zeros and zeros into ones depending upon what we're xoring with so again if i encrypt my 97 with 100 i get a five this is now my encrypted uh character and so i take that character and i xor it 
back with the same key that I used before. And look what happens. I end up back at the same number that I started at, right? The same character that I started at, right? So I XOR it once with a key. I get the encrypted version. I take the encrypted version and XOR it with the same exact key. I'll now get the decrypted version back out, right? And so it's this property of being able to XOR it with the same key and get my original value back out of that's you know how we're going to encrypt and decrypt okay so let's go ahead and we'll open up visual studio and so in visual studio i have uh what i'm calling a diary entry so dear diary i'm so sad today andrew ate my cereal i really like my cereal so that made me really sad right and then maybe i have another entry that says dear diary Today I ate Andrew's cereal as payback. Yeah. Okay. So I have these entries and I want to keep them private. So I'm going to go ahead and encrypt my diary today with a special password. And so if you don't have that special password, you can't decrypt, you know, uh, my diary. Okay. So we'll go ahead and we'll create a new file. All right. So I'm clicking, uh, you know, inside here, I'm going to do a new file and I'll just call this xor.py, right? So as a part of standard uh, Linux, Unix type operating systems, you'll, you'll typically see something like this. And this just means that, hey, uh, if I'm trying to run this file, you know, directly and I'm not telling you what to use to execute this file, go ahead and use Python 3 in order to execute it. So again, if you're on a Windows computer, this doesn't really matter. Uh, but for my computer, it comes in handy to, to put these things on there. Anyway, so we want to see, can we at least open up our diary, print out the contents, and then close it, right? So that's the first step. So we could do something like this. There are a couple different ways that you can open files in Python. One is with a with context. So we can say with open, and we'll say, this is my diary. Um, basically naming it F, and I'm just gonna print F.read, okay? So this is a very quick way of opening up our diary. And typically you would put some type of mode in here. So in this case, we'll say, I'm gonna open it in read mode, right? And so I'm gonna open my diary in read mode, and then I'm going to print out having read from it, right? So if everything works right, we'll hit the little play button here and we'll see that I get a file not found. So why do I get a file not found? Uh, let's make sure I'm in the correct directory of where my file actually is. So PWD says, okay, I'm in home, Ron project, STEM club of America. And that is in my temp folder. So we'll go into temp. I do a list or ls, that's a long list. I do see that I have diary and my ROT13 program from our last meetup and this new XOR program. So let me hit it again and now it works, right? So it had an issue finding the file just because where my terminal was, wasn't in the correct folder, right? So it says exactly what's in my um, diary, so cool. I'm able to open it. Now, this automatically opens it. And when the with context is done, it goes ahead and it closes it. But we're going to use a slightly different syntax today where I have to open it and I have to close it myself because it'll it'll just flow a little, little bit better with how our program works. So we're going to take this. We'll take that off. We'll take that off. And we're going to save... Uh, are open, right? So this is going to give us like a file descriptor, some kind of file object in Python that we can interact with. And we'll say this is my, uh, we'll just call this old file equals open diary. And then we can now print old file dot read. So that's cool. And then we need to close it. So we have old file dot close. 
I'll save that and I'll click play and guess what we get the same exact thing we just had to do a few more steps in here right okay cool so we know we can open the file we know we can print its contents and we know we can close it right well I'm not trying to print it I'm trying to encrypt it right so let's get rid of that all right and let's since we're good programmers we're going to go ahead and write a function uh, to kind of do this for us, right? So that I can just call that function whenever I want to encrypt and I can call that function whenever I want to decrypt. So let's say uh, we'll call it um, XOR file. And we'll say the things that this function is going to get is a new file. Uh, no, let's do it this way. We'll say the first thing coming in is our old file. We're going to save it off in a new file. And I'm going to need some type of key, right? So something that's going to provide me a way of, of encrypting and decrypting, right? So something, right? So that means I can no longer name this. I'm really good at stomping over myself. But we'll get rid of that. And we'll say this is old file. And we're just going to name this old, all right? And that means I'm also going to have a new file. I'm going to open new file. But instead of opening in read mode, this time I'm going to open it in write mode because this is the one we're going to write to, right? So let me tab this in. And if I have old close, I also need to have new close. You could always close the files when you're done with them, right? And so what I'll have down here is I'm going to call, you know, my program. So let's let's say our key is equal to my super secret key, right? Very great password, right? Or passphrase or whatever you want to call it, right? And I'll say... Uh, We can name this whatever we want, but we'll say old file is going to be equal to diary, right? New file will be equal to our old file plus dot ENC. Let me get rid of this bottom so you can see more of the screen. So essentially, it's going to open up my diary file. And then I'm going to create a new file that's going to be called diary.enc. So I know that this is the encrypted version of my file. All right. And we won't delete our old file just so that we can see that they're all there and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so the thing that I'll do is I'll call my XOR file and I will pass it my old file my new file, and my key. And so what we're expecting to have happen is diary goes in, it gets encrypted, and it gets rewritten out as diary.enc using my little passphrase here, right? So if that all works, you know, we should be good. So let's go ahead and save. Right now it won't do anything. We'll hit play. And what we'll see is that we now have this encrypted folder or encrypted file, right? Because all we did was opened it in write mode and then closed it, right? So we see the size is currently zero because we didn't write anything to it. So we haven't made any real changes, but what we can see is that we were able to open files and then go ahead and close them. So I'm gonna go ahead and build a loop, right? And so, uh, one of the things that we'll do is loop over character by character. And before I do that, because I got a little bit ahead, what we found is in our lab today, uh, this mostly worked. It was like a 99% solution, but every now and then we saw a weird entry in our, um, in our output. Uh, and I looked at it after our uh, meetup and the issue I found was that sometimes 
if I take a certain character and I XOR it with my key and then try to cast it back to a, a character to write out, what I'll find is that casting doesn't always work because I may end up with a value that doesn't fall well within that ASCII chart that I print out, right? So we looked and we had all of these values before, right? Well, sometimes the values that we end up with don't end up as characters that write well. For instance, uh, in my example, I was ending up with a 13. A 13 is a carriage return. Okay, cool. The problem is the operating system I'm on doesn't typically use carriage returns. It uses new line characters, right? So um, it's the actual line feed character that I'm used to seeing in a text file. Now the Windows operating system uses both, right? So a carriage return, it pairs up a carriage return and a line feed. One brings you to the line below it and then the carriage return brings you back to the front of the line. Linux, they just use a line feed and that does the whole thing, right? So that made some issues in writing carriage returns out to my file and expecting it you know, to come back correctly. So we're gonna run into slight issues there. So to get around that, instead of writing out the actual character, we're just gonna write out the binary data, which means that instead of an R to read and a W to write, we're gonna see something like RB and WB, meaning that I'm gonna open these files in binary mode and I'm going to uh, work with the raw binary, the raw bits, instead of you know expecting, oh, I'm gonna get a text character back and I'm gonna to have to you know convert that character into a, a a value with the ORD function. We saw the ORD function in our last one. So if I do something like Python 3 and my mic is in my way, um, we could see that we could do an ORD of A and it gives me 97 back. So this was a way for me to convert, you know, that A character back to that decimal number that I saw before, right? So Given that I'm opening in binary mode, I'm gonna get the raw stuff to me and I don't have to do this ORD conversion, right? If we were just gonna work on the raw text, then yeah, we would we would have to, to do these kinds of things, right? But because I'm opening it in binary mode, I don't have to worry about that piece. And that also allows me to write it back out in binary mode. And so even though those characters don't convert well, on my operating system, they'll go into the file just fine and I can bring them back out of the file just fine as well. Okay, so let's take a look. So we're gonna go ahead and first things first, let's figure out how long of a key we were given, right? So we'll do uh, key len equals the len of our key, right? We want to know this because our message, whatever file we're encrypting, could be really, really long. But our key may not be, right? Now, you'll want a good long password or passphrase or whatever. Um, but typically, those are not nearly as long as the thing we're encrypting, right? So we're going to end up having to loop over our key multiple times as we're using it to encrypt this file, right? And that means knowing the length of it will be good because we need to know when to loop back to the beginning of our the beginning of our key right so now let's loop across the uh contents of our old file and this is going to look a little bit odd but if you followed along in our last lab we used the enumerate function and what the enumerate function allowed us to do if i go back to python uh, the enumerate function allowed us to uh, not only get the value that's there, but the index value as well. So if we think back to when we had lists, right? So a list may have been five entries, right? So the very first entry was index. It was at index position zero. And then the next one was at one and then two and then three and then four, right? 
So we see the same thing. So if I do something like for uh, index comma data in, and we'll just loop across uh, super whatever. All right, we'll just call it super. And we can print index and data. What we'll see uh, is that uh, it's going to blow up in my face because I didn't do enumerate. Enumerate. The arrow back up and print. Okay. And so we see that we get our individual character back out, but we also get the index position, right? So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, along with those characters. So we're going to use that to keep our um, keep our key in sync with it, right? So we're going to continue to use those index values to move across my key. And then when I get to the end of my key, I'm going to have to move back to the beginning and then loop across my key so that I can go character by character as I'm comparing it to what I read from the file. All right. So exit from there, bring this back up. So let's do that for index comma data in enumerate. And this should be my old dot read, right? So I'm reading from it. And there we go. So that's our, our top line. This will read character by character from our old file. It'll use enumerate so that we get not only the index position, but the data itself, right? And so the first thing I'm going to then do is my ORD operation. So we'll say, uh, let's say new value equals, uh, this will be my data X or, so this carrot little character means XOR to Python, right? So that's what's actually applying the XOR. And now I need to XOR it with my key, right? So we'll have key. And now we're going to use these brackets. And again, this is going to enable me to grab out a specific character. So let's go back to our Python terminal. And we'll say, what if our key was equal to super secret? And so by using this uh, bracket syntax, I could say, well, if I want zero, I get the first S. If I want the one, I get the U, right? And so on and so forth, right? And so I'll do the index position. Now, if I just do this, eventually uh, I get to the end of my key and I need something to bring me back to the beginning of my key because again, the thing I'm encrypting is probably longer than the key that I'm using. And so we'll use our modulus operator kind of like we did in uh, the lab previous where we were uh, having to uh, basically iterate or move through the alphabet. And we had to know when we got to the end of the alphabet and rotate us back. Well, in that case, we did a mod 26 because there were 26 letters in the alphabet. So again, this mod is a remainder operation. It's going to take uh, the first value, divide it by the second value, and return the remainder. So in our case, let's say if we were still doing ROT uh, 13, we've gotten to the 26th. Maybe our index moved to 26, so we mod it by 26. So now it's 26 divided by 26. It goes in evenly, and we get a remainder of zero. And by doing that, the zero is what actually makes it back in, which puts us back at the beginning of the alphabet. And if index gets incremented again, now we're at 27. So we take 27, divide it by 26, we get a remainder of one. So that's moved as one character in. And so by doing this, we end up uh, moving across uh, our uh, whatever we're you know iterating across and ever, Whenever we get to the end, it automatically moves us back and we start the process over again. So that's why we got our key len before. Now we have our key length, right? So now we have uh, a way of rotating back to the beginning. We'll never go past the end of our key. We'll always move back to the beginning, right? So now we have our new value 
and it is the result of taking what we read from the file and XORing it with our key. Now, our key in this case is a character, right? So this needs to, to have OR applied to it. So I actually have a number to apply uh, to this thing. And so let's go ahead and do that. We'll apply OR to that. And let's go ahead. We're not going to write anything out, but let's go ahead and check to make sure we haven't made any mistakes because more than likely I've made a mistake already. So if I hit play, what I'm finding is that, okay, well, it didn't throw any errors, right? So it seems to me like this ORD worked correctly and I got a new value out. And we can kind of prove that by printing our new value. And this might throw a fit. I doubt it. It'll probably work. Okay. So it did work. And so we got this integer value out. And these are the encrypted uh, characters, right? So we read in a character and we XOR that character with part of our, uh, or, or a character from our passphrase. And we store that new value and, and we're printing it out. So it looks to me like it's working, so that's good. So let's go ahead and now write that to our new file. So we'll say new dot write, and we'll pass in our new value. Now, more than likely, here's where we're going to run into problems, right? So our our um, file is in binary mode, but what we're giving it is an integer, right? The result of this XOR is an integer value. And so this is probably going to throw a fit. So let's give it a try. Let me slide down. And yes, in fact, it did. So it said a bytes like object is required, not int. Right. So what does that mean? Well, in Python, uh, let's see, am I in the right? Yeah, so with open and we'll do our diary. And we'll do RB. So we're going to read from our diary. And we'll say f.read. Notice here, there's a little B in front of it, right? And this little B basically says this is a byte string, right? Um, it is, is a string. Uh, of bytes. Although it looks normal to me, under the hood, these are actual bytes, right? And so these are the representations of these characters. But if I had binary data in my file, it would be just as happy with that as well. So what it's saying is, hey, you know, uh, in order to write to a binary file, you need to give me bytes, not integers, right? So in order to do that, what we can do is like if I have this, um, let's say my value is a 10, right? What I can do is if I look at what are all the things I can call on this value, one of the things I can call is two bytes, right? So this allows me to convert this value to bytes and so that I can write it. So it'll look something like this, value dot two bytes. And it, it needs two arguments here. So we have length. And in my case, I'm only writing out a single byte. And so this is fine. And then I need to give it some type of, um, not encoding, but, uh, there's this concept of endianness, right? Do we represent numbers this way or do we represent numbers this way? Meaning left to right, right to left. In endianness, it's it's really, do I, they call them uh, least significant bits or you know most significant bits, right? And it depends on how I store that on disk, you know, which endianness I'm in. Most modern systems nowadays, 
tablets, like our home computers that I'm recording this on, are little endian, right? So we'll say, uh, I don't even think the term is endian this, but let's go ahead. We'll do this because that'll give me the error so that I can say, okay, it's byte order, right? So comma byte order equals little, right? And notice here, I get back something that has a B in front of it. So this is a byte string, right? So it has converted that to a byte string. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Let me close this out and we'll do dot two byte. My length is gonna be one, writing out a single byte, right? And uh, what was it uh, again? Byte order, byte order equals little, right? I'll go ahead and save that and hit play. And let's see int object has no ab oh it's not two byte it's two bytes all right hit play again and notice no error right so that's cool so if i look i have a diary.enc and notice my diary has things in it notice it's also the same size as our original diary so we haven't fundamentally you know added anything new or taken anything away from our file we just made it so that hopefully it's harder to read so let's let's take a look at it. so there's this program called cat and this allows me to output the contents of a file so diary dot enc and what we see is well that looks like garbage but if we look at our original diary oh well, that makes sense so this was my original diary and this is my encrypted diary, right? So kind of hard to tell what that is. Uh, now, obviously we're applying some really weak encryption. We're applying some really weak you know, passwords, but for all intents and purposes, this is an encrypted file, right? You cannot read the contents of this and figure out what its original meaning was without having to work hard to figure it out, right? So, we know we can encrypt, but can we decrypt? So let's give that a try. So let's go ahead and XOR our file. We're gonna pass in the new file. So this is our encrypted file. And we're gonna pass in, uh, let's go ahead and rename these so it's a little bit easier. So we have our old file, we have our encrypted file. Now we'll have a decrypted file. And we'll call that uh, encrypted file, which means this has to be encrypted file. We'll have our decrypted file. And we'll pass in the original key, right? This is important. We have to use the same key to decrypt it as what we use to encrypt it. And We'll go ahead and save that. So if I hit play, I should see nothing come out, right? So nothing erred. And we can try that again just so that you can see. So nothing erred. If I do uh, a long listing, I do see that I now have a deck file, so a decrypted file. It's also the same size. So if I cat out my diary.dec, uh, only if I spell it correctly, I get my original message back out. Well, how can we also verify that they're the same? Well, there's a couple things we could do. There's a program called diff, and we could do our diary against our diary.deck. Nothing comes back. That means that according to the diff program, the contents of these two files are exactly the same. All right, so there's also a SHA-256 sum, and we can do diary, 
And that gives me this really long number. Now this really long number basically says, hey, I went in and performed a hash operation and it resulted in this number. So if I change any little thing in the file, it's gonna change this number, right? And so it's a good way to validate that you, you know, nothing has changed in your file if you compare it to what the original uh, sum was. So if I do it on deck, what I see is that in fact, the numbers are exactly the same, meaning that I was able to encrypt my file, write it out to disk, and then use that same password or passphrase to decrypt that file and the contents didn't change at all. They're exactly the same files. And that's, a, that's what we want. In our example today, uh, you know, we, instead of working with binary data, we worked on the characters themselves. And so the files ended up not being the same. There were, there were some slight issues. And so this is a better approach uh, especially because now I can encrypt things that may not just be text, right? So the example today we had, uh, because we were operating on just text, what if I wanted to encrypt a picture? Or what if I wanted to, to um, uh, encrypt a different type of file that is definitely not text? Well, it would have had problem because it's, it's trying to open everything up and interpret it as if it was text. By doing it this way, I could encrypt a picture. I could encrypt an executable, right? Um, so I don't have an executable in, in this directory, um, but essentially, you know, um, I mean, I could go down that route and, and do that. But the, the, the point is, is that by doing it in this way with RB and WB, working on just the binary portion or the, you know, binary data instead of you know interpreting it as text i don't have those mess ups from before right and now i can use you know text files uh binary files you know you name it i can encrypt and decrypt now again weak encryption but it still works so there's a lot we could do to kind of make this program a little bit nicer clean it up a little bit make it a little bit more usable but it does what we were hoping it would do right and so i hope that was helpful to you to to be able to see that we can use things like xor uh to encrypt you know uh, and decrypt and you also saw you know a an example of a symmetric algorithm where we're using the same key for encryption and decryption and then i hope you know your python skills went up a little bit right anytime you write a little bit of code that's experience, right? And the more experience we get, the better we'll be as programmers, okay? So I'm gonna wrap it up there. This video has gone way too long because uh, I like to talk, uh, but uh, I appreciate you guys hanging in there uh, and uh, I will catch you during the uh, next meetup.